All right, guys. So let's get started. Um, let me go ahead and share that image. That way it's not just all black when everybody else is watching the video. So we're going to get started reading. We're going to do chapter one because last time, like I said, we did the introduction. So let me see. Let me bypass this and go to chapter one. <clears throat> And I had shared some links in the chat, Valerie. Um, I just posted one of them in face on Facebook. I'm sorry, but it's just a platform log to help you keep track of any platforms that you may be signed up with. All right, let me close these windows out so that my connection doesn't get all wonky on me. All right, so let's get started. All right, so chapter one, the surprising power of atomic habits. Let me see how many page this is, pages this is. Ooh, okay. That's a lot. Brought my water. <laughs> All right, so, okay. All right, so it says, the fate of British cycling changed one day in 2003. The organization, which was the governing body for professional cycling in Great Britain, had recently hired Dave Brailsford as its new performance director. At the time, professional cyclists in Great, Great Britain had endured nearly 100 years of mediocrity. Since 1908, British Riders had won just a single gold medal at the Olympic Games, and they had fared, ev fared I'm sorry, even worse in cycling's biggest race, the Tour de France. In 110 years, no British cyclist had ever won the event. In fact, the performance of British riders had been so underwhelming that one of the top bike manufacturers in Europe refused to sell bikes to the team because they were afraid that it would hurt sales if other professionals saw the Brits using their gear. <laughs> Dang, that's messed up. Braille's four had been hired to put British cycling on the on a new trajectory. What made him different from previous coaches was his relentless commitment to a strategy that he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains, which was the philosophy of searching for a tiny margin of improvement in everything you do. Burlesford said the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together. Hmm, that's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Burlesford and his coaches began by making small adjustments to um, small adjustments you might expect from a professional cycling team. They redesigned the bike seats to make them more comfortable and rubbed alcohol on the tires for a better grip. They asked riders to wear electrically heated overshorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature while riding and use biofeedback sensors to monitor how each athlete responded to a particular workout. The team tested various fabrics in a wind tunnel and had their outdoor riders switch to indoor racing suits which proved to be lighter and more aerodynamic. But they didn't stop there. Burroughs Ford and his team continued to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas. They tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the fastest muscle recovery. They hired a surgeon to teach each rider the best way to wash their hands to reduce the chances of catching a cold. Okay. They determined the type of pillow and mattress that led to the best night's sleep for each rider. They even painted the inside of the team truck white, which helped them spot little bits of dust that would normally slip by unnoticed, but could degrade the performance of the finely tuned bikes. As these and hundreds of other small improvements accumulated, the results came faster than anyone could have imagined. Just five years after Brailsford took over, the British cycling team dominated the road and track cycling events at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, where they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. 
Four years later, when the Olympic Games came to London, the Brits raised the bar as they set nine Olympic records and seven world records. That same year, Bradley Wiggins became the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The next year, his teammate Chris Froome won the race and he would go on to win again in 2015, 16, and 17, giving the British team five Tour de France victories in six years. During the 10-year span from 2007 to 2017, British cyclists won 178 world championships and 60, <clears throat> 66 Olympic or Paralympic gold medals and captured five Tour de France victories in what is widely regarded as the most successful run in cycling history. How does this happen? How does a team of previously ordinary athletes transform into world champions with tiny changes that, at first glance, would seem to make a modest difference at best? Why do small improvements accumulate into much remarkable results, and how can you replicate this approach in your own life? So I want to stop there because I think that that is very interesting, and it is something that we can apply not only to our life, right, but to our businesses. Business, yeah, definitely business. We sometimes we get stuck thinking we have to do these really big things mm -hmm. to see big changes. But in actuality, it's the little things that we can do to see big results. Mm -hmm. And no one can really, it's not a cookie cutter thing. You know, you have to evaluate what you're doing in your life, you know, as far as your habits go and business habits mm -hmm. because sometimes those two match you know what you do in your daily life it ends up pouring over into your business right mm -hmm. the things that you think are important or unimportant um the steps that you take to get towards results for different things that you want to do so i thought that was very interesting what do you guys think Oh, definitely. I believe in it. Yeah. When you, when you see this, something like this, you, it's kind of like open your mind. You, I'm, I'm going to have to start thinking about what I could do, um, how to, to start implementing little habits yeah. so that I can get my results that I want. Mm -hmm. Now I don't, I don't have that. I mean, maybe I have, but I don't pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. What about you, Valerie? Yeah, well, I thought that was real interesting that um, they were, they only did, he said they uh, improved 1%. They, you know, each thing they, um, they kind of like fine tuned and, and uh, changed and mm -hmm. got, uh, you know, really great results from it. Just, yeah. Absolutely. That's just like, for example, how I said at the um, end of the year, I was going to start using a planner because for some reason, I am always forgetting appointments and different things that I have to do or do for myself or my kids or work or my business. So me keeping a planner, as small as that is, it has made a big difference. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue to keep using it because I need to make sure I stay organized because I have a lot going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I work and then I have two kids where I have to make sure I keep up with what's going on with them. And then I have to keep up with what's going on at, um, at, did I say work already? And in my daily life, period, like what about myself? I have appointments just like they do. Right. So it's a lot. It's a lot to keep up with. And I used to try to keep up with that using my phone. But it failed. That, that approach failed for me. You know, some people was like really good, but for me, it's not. The only time I do use my phone is when I have my customers schedule an appointment on my website and it automatically comes to my phone. I just have it set up that way. So that works because I don't have to go into my phone and manually do the appointment. It automatically just comes through and it automatically saves itself wherever I told it to save it once a person schedules an appointment with me. Mm -hmm. So that's the only time I have appointments on my, um, 
on my phone. Anything that comes through automatically. <laughs> Other than that, it's like, oh, I forgot to put that in there. <laughs> so my planner definitely works. All right. Yeah, and Berger, uh when I'm using my planner, because I, I had one last year, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. I did pretty good, but I kind of slacked off closer to the end of the year. And I noticed that l- long as I'm uh, using it, you know, regular on a regular basis, then um, I'm able to keep up with my appointments and stuff. Like, like the last mm-hmm. two weeks, I kind of slacked on it, and then I was finding that I was missing stuff. So I, I, I oh man, and yeah. So <laughs> I'm, um, I'm gonna have to, you know, just, just, um, you know, just get get on on it you know get on top of it mm-hmm. and it's so frustrating when you miss appointments isn't it it's like dang i like i, I thought yeah. i remembered mm-hmm. and that's why i can't use my phone because <laughs> then it no longer becomes me remembering the appointment it becomes me remembering to put it in my phone mm-hmm. whereas it's much quicker for me to write it down because when i go on my phone i have to choose the date I have to go to the time. I have to type in what it is. I have to put in what I want it to remind me. Um, that's just a lot. That's a lot of different steps. So that's why I never remember to put them in. Yeah. And it's something about writing it down that is yeah. just better. Exactly. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You sound just like me <laughs> with that. It's like, it's just easier, you know? <laughs> All right. Let's continue on. Why small habits make a big difference? It is so easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making small improvements on a daily basis. Too often, we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action. Isn't that what we just said? Like, we just think that we got to make this drastic change in order to see drastic results when it's not really the case. Whether it is losing weight, building a business, writing a book, winning a championship, or achieving any other goal, we put pressure on ourselves to make some earth-shattering improvement that everyone will talk about. (laughs) This is so funny because that is so true. Meanwhile, improving by 1% isn't particularly notable. Sometimes it isn't even noticeable, but it can be far more meaningful, especially in the long run. The difference a tiny improvement can make over time is astounding. Here's how the math works out. If you can get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. That is so true. (laughs) And I'll tell you guys why after. I'll tell you. Conversely, if you get 1% worse each day for one year, you will decline nearly down to zero. What starts as a small win or a minor setback accumulates into something much more. Now, What I will tell you guys is when I first became a notary, it was in July, 2020. It took me 12 months of trial and error of making change after change after change here and there before I started getting continued business. Mm. It was the longest 12 months ever. I almost closed my doors. Like, you know what? I can't keep doing this i can't keep putting energy towards this business and i it's not working for me nobody wants to work with me because i haven't had a year of experience yet and yada 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 but i feel like as soon as the 13 month came everything changed everything changed everything that i did everything i was implementing i was finally showing up um on google you know i'm saying the top 10 and then I went from the top five now I'm like the second like all of these changes but it took so long even to the point where my page got suspended and I really was like I'm I'm giving up I give up you know because when your page gets suspended you get taken off you get put all the way down when I looked back at my listing guys I was like 35 wow I was like it's no way it's no way I'm gonna come back up from this and I'm just like, I just don't know how much more I can take of it. You know, I try to stay positive. And it helped when I heard other people saying, you know, you helped me with my business. And I'm like, well, if they're following what I'm telling them to do, 
then it's got to be something like I'm, I'm going to keep at it. I'm just going to keep trying and keep going, keep pushing. And I tell you that 13 month mark, it's like I shed my skin or something. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling and I've been doing good ever since. So, but when I tell you I had to make changes upon changes, I felt like I was never going to be done with changing stuff. <laughs> it was just so stressful. Mm-hmm. So when you guys talk about how stressful it is and you're starting out, I'm, I know, I know <laughs> it is, but you can't give up and you can't stop. You just got to keep, you know, if you see that what you're doing is not working, change it. And yes, you're going to get tired of the changes. When I tell you, I couldn't even count on one hand how many times I had to change stuff up. Every time I would do something, I see it wasn't working. I stopped doing it and just change something. I'm like, nope, I can't do it this way. Let's do it this way. Oh, that's not working. Let's do it this way. Oh, oh, that's working a little bit. Oh, no, it's not. Let me change it. <laughs> it was, you know, over and over again with the changes and then starting to do things that I said I wasn't going to do. I don't have time for that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. Blah, blah, blah. But all of the things I didn't want to do or that I didn't have time for that I made time for and I actually did worked. Go figure. Yeah. So, yeah. So definitely, yes. Everything he's saying here, I definitely agree with 100%. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, yes. You're speaking my life, buddy. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Habits are the compound interest of self-improvement the same way that money multiplies through compound interest the effects of your habits multiply as you repeat them they seem to make little difference on any given day and yet the impact they deliver over the months and years can be enormous it is only when looking back two five or perhaps ten years later that the value of good habits and the cost of bad ones become strikingly apparent This can be a different concept to appreciate in daily life. We often dismiss small changes because they don't seem to matter very much in the moment. If you save a little money now, you're still not a millionaire. If you go to the gym three days in a row, you're still out of shape. If you study Mandarin for an hour tonight, you still haven't learned the language. We make a few changes, but the results never seem to come quickly. And so we slide back into our previous routines. Unfortunately, the slow pace of transformation also makes it easy to let a bad habit slide. If you eat an unhealthy meal today, the scale doesn't move much. If you work late tonight and ignore your family, they'll forgive you. If you procrastinate and put your project off until tomorrow, there will usually be time to finish it later. A single decision is easy to dismiss. But when we repeat 1% errors day after day by replicating poor decisions, duplicating tiny mistakes and rationalizing little excuses our small choices compound into toxic results Mm -hmm. it's the accumulation of many missteps a one percent decline here and there that eventually leads to a problem the impact created by a change in your habits is similar to the effect of shifting the route of an airplane by just a few degrees imagine you are flying from los angeles to new york city If a pilot leaving from Los Angeles adjusts the heading just 3.5 degrees south, you will land in Washington, D.C. instead of New York. Wow. (laughs) Such a small change is barely noticeable at takeoff. The nose of the airplane moves just a few feet, but when magnified across the entire United States, you end up hundreds of miles apart. Similarly, a slight change in your daily habits can guide your life to a very different destination fact that is a fact Mm. making a choice that is one percent better or one percent worse seems insignificant in the moment but over the span of moments that make up i mean yeah span of moments that make up a lifetime these choices determine the difference between who you are and who you could be Mm. success is the product of daily habits not once in a lifetime transformations i want to highlight this let me see Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get my slight uh, change. <laughs> I've got one highlighted too. Success is the product of a daily habit. <laughs> oh, let me see. How do I do highlight? Oh, in the book? Oh, oh you have, my a, I have a manual. I have a manual book. Yes. Oh, shoot. 
Let me see. I'm trying to see if I can, um, because I have to, I have to highlight this. Hmm. I wanted to highlight, uh, where was it? This one. How can I do that? There we go. I knew I could do it. A slight change in your daily habits can guide your life to a very different destination. That's what I wanted to highlight. I'm going to use that as a motivational quote. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see. Let's continue. Um, that said, it doesn't matter how successful or unsuccessful you are right now. What matters is whether your habits are putting you on the path toward success. Oh, I like that one too. Mm -hmm. Let, me, let me do that one. Okay. You should be far more concerned with your current trajectory. Oh, I can't pronounce that trajectory than with your current results. If you're a millionaire, but you spend more than you earn each month, then you're on a bad trajectory. If your spending habits don't change, it's not going to end well. Conversely, if you're broke, but you have a little bit every month, then you're on a path toward financial freedom, even if you're moving slower than you like. Mm. Your, <laughs> exactly. Your outcomes are a lagging measure of your habits. Your net worth is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Okay. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning habits. Your clutter is a lagging measure of your cleaning habits. You get what a, you get what you repeat. Mm. If you want to predict where you will end up in life, all you have to do is follow the curve of tiny gains or tiny losses and see how your daily choices will compound 10 or 20 years down the line. Are you spending less than you earn each month? Are you making it into the gym each week? Are you reading books and learning something new each day? Tiny battles like these are the ones that will define your future self. Mm -hmm. Time magnifies the margin between success and failure. It will multiply whatever you feed it. Excuse me. Good habits make time your ally. Bad habits make time your enemy. Mm -hmm. Habits are a double-edged sword. Bad habits can cut you down just as easily as good habits can build you up, which is why understanding the details is crucial. You need to know how habits work and how to design them to your liking so you can avoid the dangerous half of the the blade. Yep, that makes total sense. Let me see. All right. Who can read on for me? I can... Uh... Starting where it says your habits can compound for you or against you. Okay. Your habits can compound for you or against you. Positive compounding. Productivity compounds. Accomplishing one extra task is a small feat on any given day, but it counts for a lot over an entire career. The effect of automating an old task or mastering a new skill can be even greater. The more mm -hmm. tasks you can handle without thinking, the more your brain is free to focus on the other areas. Wow. Okay. Mm. Um, should I read the negative for that and just do it like that? or? Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. Um, negative compounding. Stress compounds, the frustration of a traffic jam, the weight of parenting responsibilities, the worry of making ends meet, the strain of slightly high blood pressure. By themselves, these common causes of stress are manageable. But when they persist for years, little stresses compound into serious health issues. Mm -hmm. okay. Knowledge compounds. Learning one new idea won't make you a genius, but a commitment to lifelong learning can be transformative. Transformative. Okay. <laughs> Furthermore, each book you read not only teaches you something new, 
but also opens up different ways of thinking about old ideas. As Warren Buffett says, that's how knowledge works. It builds up like compound interest. Negative thoughts compound. The more you think of yourself as worthless, stupid, or ugly, the more you condition yourself to interpret life that way. You get trapped in a thought loop. The same is true for how you think about others. Once you fall into the habit of seeing people as angry, unjust, or selfish, you see those kind of people everywhere. Mm. Mm. Relationships compound. People reflect your behavior back to you. The more you help others, the more others want to help you. Being a little bit nicer in each interaction can result in a network of broad and strong connections over time. Outrage compounds, riots, protests, and mass movements are rarely the, the result of a single event. Instead, a long series of microaggressions and daily ag aggravations slowly multiply until one event tips the scales and outrage spreads like wildfire. Mm. What progress is really like? Imagine that you have an ice cube sitting on the table in front of you. The room is cold and you can see your breath. It is currently 25 degrees. Ever so slowly, the room begins to heat up. 26 degrees, 27, 28. The ice cube is still sitting on the table in front of you. 29 degrees, 30, 31. Still nothing happened. Nothing has happened. Then 32 degrees, the ice begins to melt. A one degree shift, seemingly no different from the temperature increases before it, has unlocked a huge change. Breakthrough moments are often the result of many previous actions, which build up the potential required to unleash a major change. This pattern shows up everywhere. Cancer spends 80% of its life undetected, then takes over the body in months. Bamboo can barely be seen for the first five years as it builds extensive root systems underground before exploding 90 feet into the air within six weeks. Similarly, habits often appear to make no difference until you cross a critical threshold and unlock a new level of performance. In the mm -hmm. early and middle, did you, were you going to say something? Mm -mm. Oh. Okay. In the early and middle stages of any quest, there is often a valley of disappointment. You expect to make progress in a linear fashion, and it's frustrating how ineffective changes can seem during the first days, weeks, and even months. It doesn't feel like you are going anywhere. It's a hallmark of any compounding process. The most powerful outcomes are delayed. This is one of the core reasons why it is so hard to build habits that last. People make a few small changes, fail to see a tangible result, and decide to stop. You think, I've been running every day for a month, so why can't I see any change in my body? Once this kind of thinking takes over, it's easy to let go, to let good habits fall by the wayside. But in order to make a meaningful difference, habits need to persist long enough to break through this plateau. What, what I call the plateau of latent potential. If you find yourself struggling to build a good habit or break a bad one, it is not because you have lost your ability to improve. It is often because you have not yet crossed the plateau of latent potential. Complaining mm -hmm. about not achieving success despite working hard is like complaining about an ice cube not melting when you heated it up from 25 to 31 degrees your work has not your your work is not wasted it is just being stored all the action happens at 32 degrees 
When you finally break through the plateau of latent potential, people will call it an overnight success. The outside world only sees the most dramatic event rather than all that preceded it. But you know that it's the work you did long ago. When it seemed that you weren't making any progress, that makes the jump today possible. It is the human equivalent of geological pressure. Two tectonic plates can grind against one another for millions of years. The tension slowly building all the while. Then one day they rub each, each other once again in the same fashion they have for ages. But this time the tension is too great. An earthquake erupts. Change can take years before it happens all at once. Mastery requires patience. The San Antonio Spurs, one of the most successful teams in NBA history, have a quote from social reformer Jacob Rise hanging in their locker room. When nothing seems to help, I go and look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two, and I know it was not that last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Oh. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Don't read the figure two. Just start oh. at all big things, and then okay. I think you'll be done. Okay. All big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is a single tiny decision. But as that decision is repeated, a habit sprouts and grows stronger. Roots entrench themselves and branches grow. The task of breaking a bad habit is like uprooting a powerful oak within us. And the task of building a good habit is like cultivating a delicate flower one day at a time. But what determines whether we stick with a habit long enough to survive the plateau of latent potential and break through to the other side. What is, what is it that causes some people to slide into unwanted habits and enables others to enjoy the compounding effects of good ones? All right, so let's stop there. Let's think about that question for ourselves. What is it that causes some people to slide into unwanted habits and enables others to enjoy the compounding effects of good ones? <clears throat> That's a good question. <laughs> it is a really good question because it happens. You see people, you're like, well, how are they able to? Mm-hmm. And I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some, it feels like some people get it right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Then others are just like really struggling. Yeah. It's like, I guess you, you do it for a while and you don't see the change. But it's it's you almost got the change, you know. You're almost there to mm-hmm. the change, but you you stop because what you see in front of you, what you, what you're doing, you don't see any results, or you don't think there's any results. So you stop instead of keep going, and and, yeah. and then that's when you you know you kind of quit. You you stop, and then you don't get those results. Hmm. Yep. It's exactly what it is. You you don't see any change, so you figure to yourself, "Well, I mean, what the heck is the point?" Right. You start. Telling what is you. the point? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I feel that way all the time. Because uh, I feel like it's happened all my life, where I'll see people, you know, just get it right off the back, and it seems like me, I'm always having to invent and reinvent. What is it? Is that what I'm saying? Invent and reinvent myself over and over and over again until I finally feel I'm at a place where I like that. That's okay. Grace, did you want to add anything to it? Uh, I, I guess I guess some of us we just like the fast result, you know. And when we when we do something, if we don't get 
result right away. We seem to think it's not working, so we give up. But if we yeah. persist, you know, long enough, and uh, it could happen. Um, nothing happened overnight, like they say, right? It's persistent, yeah. repetition, and persistent. But what it make what makes it hard is for some people it does happen that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, for some people it's like you never see them struggle. Mm-hmm. You never hear them complaining about having a, having it hard. You just see they do it and then it's just done. You're like, well, dang, I've been trying to do that same thing. <laughs> I'm sure they have their bad ways, but they don't complain about it. They don't let people know about it. Just repeat it. Mm-hmm. I guess they know it's going to happen by just continuing doing what they were doing. Yeah. All right. Let's get to it. Grace, did you want to read here? Let's see. One, two. Oh, Forget about goals, focus on systems instead. Revealing mm. claims that the best way to achieve what we went what we want in life, getting into better shape, building a successful business, relaxing more and worrying less, spending more time with friends and family is to set specific actionable goals. For many years, this was how I approached my fa- my habits too. Each, each one was a goal to be reached. I set goal for the grades I wanted to get in school. For the weight, I wanted to lift in the gym. For the profits, I wanted to earn in business. I succeeded at a few but I fell at a lot of them. Eventually, I began to realize that many results had very little to do with the goals I set and nearly everything to do with the system I followed. What's the difference between systems and goals? It is a distinction I first learned from Scott Adam the uh, cartoonist behind the uh, Dilbert comic. Goals are about the results you want to achieve. Systems about the uh, pro, the process processes that uh, lead to results. If you're a coach, your goal might be to win a championship. Your system is the way you recreate you recruit players, manage your system, coach, and conduct practice. If you are an entrepreneur, your goal might be to build a million million dollar business. The system is how you test product ideas, hire employers, and run marketing campaigns. If you're a musician, your goal might be to play a new piece. Your system is how often you practice, how you break down and uh, tackle difficult measures, and your method for receiving feedback from the doctor. Now for the interesting question. If you completely ignore your goals and focus on only your system, would you still succeed? For example, if you were a basketball coach and you ignore your goal to a championship and focus only on what your team does at practice each day, would you still get results? I think I think you you would. The goal mm-hmm. is the goal in any sport is to finish with the best score, but it will be ridiculous to spend the whole game staring at the scoreboard. The only way to actually win is to get better each day. In the world of three times Super Bowl winner, 
winner bill was the score takes care of itself same is true for other areas of life if you want a better result then uh, forget about getting goals focus on your system instead what do i mean by this are goals completely useless of course not goals are not for getting for setting a direction but system are best for making progress mm. in terms of pro we highlight highlight yep <laughs> <laughs> goals are good for setting a direction but systems are best for making progress oh, okay. I like that <laughs> yeah, the examples of problem arise when you spend too much time thinking about your goals and not enough time designing your system problem one winners and losers have the same goals goal setting suffers from a serious case of uh, survivorship bias. We concentrate on the people who end up winning the survivors and mistakenly assume that um, ambitious goal lead to that success while overlooking all of the people who had the same objective but didn't succeed. Every Mm -hmm. that's what i was just saying like why is it exactly <laughs> that you have somebody with the same objective one person succeeds and another, another doesn't but but he said because probably they stopped at just having the goal and then create the system mm -hmm. that makes sense that makes sense create sorry go ahead system. i'm sorry it's just no, no. it's it's hitting me yes <laughs> so. it's, it's it's coming <laughs> Every Olympian wants to win a gold medal. Every candidate wants to get the job. And if successful and unsuccessful people share the same goals, then the goal cannot be what differentiate the winners from the losers. It wasn't the goal of winning the uh, tour, of, tour de France that propel the British cyclists to do top of the sport. Presumably, they had wanted to win the race every year before, just like every other professional team. The goal had always been there. It was the only when they implemented a system of mm -hmm. continuous sm of small implement improvement that they achieve a different outcome. Achieving a goal is only a momentary change. Imagine you have a messy room and set a goal to clean it. If you if you are if you summon the energy to a tiny room, then you will have a clear room, a clean room for now. But if you maintain the same sloppy pack rats habit that leads to a messy room in the first place, soon you'll be looking at a new pile of cluster and hoping for another burst of uh, motivation. You're left changing, you're left chasing the same outcome because you never change the system behind it. You treat mm -hmm. it as a system, a symptom without addressing the cause. Achieving a goal only change your life for the moment. That's the counter, counter, what is it? Counter remit counter intuitive, counter intuitive thing about uh, improvement. We think we need to change our results, but the results are not the problem. What we really need to change are the system that causes that cause those results. When you solve problem at the res, at the result level, you only solve them temporarily. 
in order in order to improve the, for go for good you need to solve problem at the system level fits the in, the inputs and the outputs will itself, themselves go restricts your ha happiness the, impl the implicity assumption behind any goal is that is this: once I reach my goal, then I'll be happy. The problem mm. with a goal first mentality is that you're continuously you're continually putting happiness off until the next milestone. I've mm. slipped into this trap so many times. I've lost count. For years, happiness was always something for my future self to enjoy. I promised myself that once I gain 20 pounds of muscle or after my business was future in the New York Times, then I could finally relax. Furthermore, this creates an either-or conflicts. Either you achieve your goals and are successful or you fa you fail and you are a disappointment. Mm -hmm. You mentally box yourself into a narrow version of happiness. This is misguided. It is unlikely that you actually path through life uh, will match the exact journey you had in mind when you set out. It makes no sense to restrict your satisfaction to one scenario when there are many paths to success. A system first mentality provides the antidote. When you fall into love with the process rather than the product you don't have to wait to give yourself permission to be happy you can be satisfied anytime your system is running and a system can be successful in many different forms not just the one you first inversion or go are Go out with long term progress. Finally, a goal oriented mindset can create a yo yo effort effect. Many mm -hmm. riders work hard for months, but as soon as they cross the finish line, they stop running. The race is no longer there to, to motivate them. When all of your hard work is focusing on a particular goal, what is left to push your forward to push you forward after you achieve it? This is why many people find themselves reverting to uh, their old habits after accomplishing a goal. The purpose of setting is to win the game. The purpose of a building system is to continue winning the game. The true long thinking is goal less thinking. It's not about my any single accomplishment. It is about the cycle of endless refinement and the continuous improvement. Ultimately, it is your commitment to the process that uh, will determine your progress. System hmm. of atomic. Oh, no, I'll start reading again now, Grace. Okay. Thank you. Okay. A system of atomic habits. But first, wait, I wanted to get you guys feedback on what we just read about problem one through four. Mm hmm. So let's go back. We got problem one. Winners and losers have the same goals. True. Problem two. Achieving a goal is only a momentary change. That is true. 
because it's like you work up to the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're just on to the next one. Right. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, problem three, goals restrict your happiness. They do, because I've mentioned plenty of times, I'll set goals. Well, now it's not as bad, but before I would have a goal, if I didn't meet that goal, I would be crushed. You know, my disappointment in myself is far worse than anybody else's disappointment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And lastly, goals are at odds with long term progress. That's true. Because what happens if you don't meet the goal? You stop trying, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's, I, I, uh, when people say goals, I'll be like, because, you know, you know, if I don't meet them, then I'm like, uh, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. like, then you uh, want to beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's um, and he, and he talked about systems. It's it's um, it's long. He said long term improvement. Mm-hmm. And um, and um, what do you say? The cycle of endless refinement and continuous improvement. Uh, so that is like a life. You're looking at it as a lifestyle, and uh, goals mm-hmm. is like short term, right? Uh, right, and so that's what makes the difference in you progressing because you're not looking at it as just a, a short, a something that you want to obtain for now. It's something that you want to. Uh, the system is something that you you want to continue to have in place to um, make you a better person. To keep you on the right path to keeping your weight down and um, right. keeping the bad habits, um, you know, stop, you know, stopping the bad habits and, and, uh-huh. uh, and then, you know, and, and doing the, you, you know, working the good, good habits. Mm-hmm. It's all a system. Creating mm-hmm. habits means that that's something you're going to always do. So you're creating a system. Mm-hmm. That's like for me, I've created a system in my business to make sure that I plan out my social media uh, marketing so that I don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, because I've been doing it, I did it all last year. So because I've been doing it now, it's a habit, you know, and that system actually works for me, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas in my personal life too, staying organized, keeping everything in its place, like making a place for everything and everything being in its place mm-hmm. that works for me. And when, and that's a system that I've adopted. Now my whole family, they may not <laughs> like it, but it yeah. works for me. It keeps me from blowing up, you know, having some type of order. Mm-hmm. And I just, am a, I like having company or having people visit me. And I just feel like if my house is in disarray, mm-hmm. then I'm not going to want people to visit. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> like, nope, I don't want nobody to come visit me and send my house nasty. But yeah. if I always have things in order because I like having company, I'll never mind anyone coming over. Right. You know, or that will just not be my reason for you not coming over because my house is nasty. It might be because I just don't feel like having company because that does happen. Like, I just don't feel like being bothered. Like, you know, but... It'll never be because of that. So yes, those systems, and I, I work at it all the time. So those work. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like he said, a goal, if I just had a goal, all right, this month we're going to keep the house clean. The next month is going to be like, okay, well, we can go back to not caring because we met the goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and finish this up. A system of atomic habits. If you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem isn't you. The problem is your system. Bad habits repeat themselves again and again, not because you don't want to change, but because you have the wrong system for change. You do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Oh, no. Yeah, it says fall. I thought it said fail. Focusing on the overall system rather than a single goal is one of the core themes of this book. It is also one of the deeper meanings behind the word atomic. By now, you've probably realized that an atomic habit refers to a tiny change, a marginal gain, a 1% improvement. But atomic habits are not just any old habits. However small, they are little habits that are a part of a larger system. 
Just as atoms are the building blocks of molecules, atomic habits are the building blocks of remarkable um, results. Habits are like the atoms of our lives. Each one is a fundamental unit that contributes to your overall improvement. At first, these tiny routines seem insignificant, but soon they build on each other and fuel bigger wins that multiply to a degree that far outweighs the cost of their initial investment. They are both small and mighty. This is the meaning of the phrase atomic habits, a regular practice or routine that is not only small and easy to do, but also the source of incredible power, a component of the system of compound growth. All right, so here's the chapter summary. Habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. Getting 1% better every day counts for a lot in the long run. Habits are a double-edged sword. They can work for you or against you, which is why understanding the details is essential. Small changes often appear to make no difference until you cross a critical threshold. The most powerful outcomes of any compounding process are delayed. You need to be patient. An atomic habit is a little habit that is part of a larger system. Just as atoms are the building blocks of molecules, atomic habits are the building blocks of remarkable results. If you want better results, then forget about setting goals. Focus on your systems instead. You do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Mm. All right. So we are done. And mm. that was a good first. That's only the first chapter. Yeah. I mean, it gets better from there. <laughs> My goodness. Mm -hmm. So what did you guys think? I thought it was excellent. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah. He's nailing it. He's nailing it. Mm -hmm. Very thought provoking. Yes. Yes. I'm gonna share this summary on Facebook. I to find um because that was wow. That was good. All right. Well, so we'll be reading because these chapters are so long, it's gonna take us a while yeah. to go through it. Because um, well, it's be much better even to, to do slowly so we don't rush, we need to absorb yeah. it. I'm a slow reader, so I have to absorb yeah. what I'm okay. reading. If I rush mm -hmm. it, there's no point. <laughs> okay, that, that makes sense. So yeah, we're going to take our time with this. We're going to read one chapter each session because okay. there's so much in it and there's questions. Yeah. So I just feel like if we were to like read two chapters, we would be all over the place, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so we're just going to read one chapter at a time, but that was good. Thank you guys for helping me read that. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and um, thanks for adding to it, you know, with, with, you know, answering the questions and us just really trying to um, relate ourselves to the information. Yeah. Because that makes a big difference. Yeah. All right. So then um, next week, same time, same place. Okay. okay. All right, guys. Have a good night. Okay, you too. Bye. 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 Bye.